some visiting speakers. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just open the service in prayer and then I'll hand over to them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together in your house on this, the first day of the week, a reminder that it's the day of resurrection and all the difference that makes to our lives, that Jesus Christ is alive. You promise to be here in our midst. We ask, Lord, that you'll quieten our hearts and our thoughts. You'll enable us to think on you to hear your voice, to declare your praises, to be challenged and spoken to by your Holy Spirit. So we commit this service into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, Becky. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. Um, just need to talk. Right, so yeah, good to be here. And I just a, a, um, a note that there's so much collaboration goes into doing a Sunday service. I've, I've realised that, and it's yeah, it's just a mind-boggling and awe-inspiring of, of how people work together to get to produce this. So it's really good. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to Gerald, I think, for the notices. If that's okay, Gerald. Oh, welcome to you all this morning, especially any visitors with us uh, today. Uh, and thank you to Paul and Rebecca for taking the service for us this morning. Evening services continue on Zoom 6.30, an informal uh, service, but join in if you can. Um, tomorrow evening 6.30 is the prayer meeting. Uh, it's the 1st of August. Uh, so it's the beginning of the month prayer meeting. So if you have uh, items for putting on the uh, prayer request list, let Leona have those. Uh, and do come and join in the meeting tomorrow as 
uh, uh, per usual. Is it zoomed as well? For, yeah. yeah. So so if you can't get here, it is on the the, the zoom thing as well. Uh, we've hit the summer holiday period in particular now, so lots of the things grind to a halt for a while, uh, so the young people's meetings aren't on. But also, throughout August, we do not have the Tuesday morning uh, Bible study at 10.30, so that they're not on for August. Uh, of course, there's camp coming up uh, on the on the 13th of August for the week, so if you intend to book and haven't, uh, do. Uh, next Sunday, 10.30, our pastor is our speaker. And I think that's it for notices for now. Thank you. I think this is on, should it be? <laughs> Thank you, Gerald. Um, later on, we'll, we'll um, sing for any birthdays, so I think we'll do that a bit later on, if that's okay. So, yeah, I just feel the need to pray before we go into the service a bit. Thanks for your prayer as well, Chris. Um, and I was going to put my phone on silent, and that was a good point. <laughs> but, you know, so, yeah, thank you. Now, thanks for that reminder, God. <laughs> so, okay then. So, we're going to pray then. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you that we can come before you today, um, just as we are, Lord, and that none of us are qualified to come to you um, before your throne. We stand before you because of Jesus' completed work on the cross, Lord, before your throne of grace. So we pray that our worship will be acceptable to you this day, Lord, and we pray that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. For Jesus' name's sake, amen. So we're going to do two songs together now. And the second song um, lends itself really well to some instruments that hopefully the children might want to take up. So Josie, could you help, um, or anyone, would you like to just come and choose an instrument for yourself? And then in the second song, you can use it if you want to. Try not to be shy. Um, <laughs> there's some good blockers. <laughs> no, you're not feeling it. <laughs> or you can do it before the second song you don't have to take it now so the first song is Over All the Earth You Reign on High and then the second song is Jubilate it's kind of got a Hebrew feel to it and that's the one we were going to do the, the instruments to okay, so I'm going to go back and sit over there
I chose that song because Josie was singing it at school a lot lately and she got into it and we knew some of the children go to the same school. They're not all here today, just Josie, but hopefully I um, enjoyed that. Okay, I'm going to do a children's talk now, so hoping it goes okay for you. I'm going to come down and switch to this mic. Okay. So the other Friday, I received a letter and it said, the householder. And I opened it, obviously, as you do, normally. <laughs> and I had a letter. Let me find a letter. We got too tired yet. Where did I put it now? A bit like our house. You never can find something when you need it. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> so, yes, I'm going to plug this in. Can you all hear me okay? So, it said this word on it. Can anybody read this word? If you can, speak it out. Urgent. <laughs> and it was in big, bold letters, a bit like that. Okay. So, I thought, oh, this is important. Can anybody think what could be urgent? And I would just like you to use your imagination here and make up what you think could be urgent to the householder. Um, yes, hello. coming. It doesn't have to be right and it, you know I just want the most imaginative thing ever. Yes Tracy. You paid for a puppy and you didn't know. I paid for a puppy and I didn't know. Gosh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's incurring a, a, a bill <laughs> being in a, in, a, in a place that I, I should be looking after it myself. That's a very good one, very imaginative. I didn't put her up to that. <laughs> Any other suggestions? Really, it can be really out there or like maybe. Oh, yes. <laughs> that would be very scary as well as urgent. <laughs> but, okay, anybody else? Last chance for anyone? Josie, anyone? A lion came. Shouldn't it be a tiger? A tiger's coming to tea. Or a lion then? Okay, a lion's coming to tea. Okay, all right then. Well, I ought to probably say what it did say, shall I? No, just to show you that I'm not making it up. There we go. <laughs> <I don't really laughs> Dear homeowner, urgent buyer request for your property. I am writing to inquire if you are considering selling your property as we have a number of interested buyers looking for a property which is just another word for a house, similar to yours. I must stress, this is a serious inquiry, and we would like to hear from you if you are considering selling your property in the near future. Yours sincerely, Hugh Kennedy. Okay, got a name to it there. Then. Now, soon after I got this letter, it was a Friday, and I, was going, I went on the, the school run. I was walking down the road, and I saw the man delivering these letters into every house. So it wasn't just our house, it was for every house. I must say, <laughs> we live in a bungalow and our road is a road of bungalows, so I'm thinking that it might be... Am I a bit loud, Jessie? You can go back if you want. Um, maybe some older folk want to live in our road because bungalows are just that bit more accessible for older people. So I began, I began to see this man and delivering them, and I thought, uh, as I often do, I thought that the good news of Jesus is for that man, too. You know, it's not just for me, it's for him as well. I didn't get speaking to him because I was on the way to the, the school run, and, um, but I think that I was inspired with the idea that there is one person who wants to come and live in every home in my road. Now, who do you think that is? Who do you think wants to come and live in every home on my road? And your road. The Queen. The Queen. I think she's got enough properties, but yeah. <laughs> Josie? God. Yes, God. Or you could call him Jesus as God. I think he wants to come to every home on my street. And actually every home on your street. And no matter where you live, he wants to be there, okay? He really does. Because actually this is his world. And he wants to bring it back to how it should, it was intended to be. You probably might know the verse, John 3.16. And could some grown-ups say it for us? Is that okay? Or you can learn it. So, yeah. God so loved the world, and he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Now, I thought I'd look at Ephesians, well, I was appointed by a devotional that I had to look at Ephesians 3, verse 16 and 17. And I've got it here from the message version, so I'm just going to read it up to you. And it's a call to pray. He said, I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit, not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. There's a bit more to the verse of um, 17 as well. So, for the next bit, the light box.
or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We, fini we finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion in your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. She was on her tiptoes there saying that all the time. Oh. <laughs> um, we're going to have two songs together, and after the songs, or during, the, the children like to go down. Um, just to say on the end of that passage that Paul's focusing on the very last verse, with, uh, last, last two verses, is that fair to say? We thought we'd have the whole psalm, kind of. We thought we'd have the whole psalm for reference. But the two songs we're going to sing first are Jesus, Take Me As I Am, and then Jesus, You Are Changing Me. Jesus, take me as I am.
and you've turned your horse. So, I think I was going to add to the, um, the letter that we received. Uh, we're shared owners in our house, in our, in our home. We've got shared ownership, so we have half mortgage and a half rental with Hyde Housing. So even if we wanted to jump at the chance of that letter, we couldn't because we'd have to go through the Housing Association. <coughs> and where am I going with this? <laughs> I, think, I think, just to say really, that, um, we, oh sorry, I'll just, <laughs> what does that mean then, given the children's talk, that if we only give Jesus half of our lives, or even three quarters of it, say we were three quarters owners, um, then, you know, that's, um, that's not quite good enough for Jesus, really. And I, I'm talking to myself here. He wants us to be all, all in, so to speak, which I know too well is easier said than done. But as, as Jesus said, um, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And that's from Mark chapter 8, verse 35. So it's just a bit of a challenge, really, that um, we do need to to give him our, our, our whole lives. Um, I heard, a, a, I get these video blogs from a man called Simon Gilbo, who um, is, uh, has a, a foundation in um, Burundi, and um, it's based on a devotion that he does every day, and he sends it out every Tuesday, and he, he talked about Edwin Orr, who studied revival, and he took students from America to the UK to um, see where John Wesley had spent many hours in prayer for revival. Um, and it had come, the revival had come. And there were in the carpets, there were, I think, two kind of knee, you know, obviously two knee indents, but in two places probably. And they went back to the coach and did the head count. And there was one missing. So he went back up to this room, this bedroom, <laughs> and he just could see a man in the same place, pouring out his heart and asking for revival and to start with him. And after a while, you know, he let him carry on and, and then he disturbed the man a bit, um, just saying, I've got other things to see, come with us. And then Billy Graham got up and, he, and the rest is history, really, you know, how, how Billy had devoted his life there. Um, I'll start, you know, there's a simple prayer, um, start with me, Lord. So I think we're going to have um, another song, and then we're going to have Paul come to do a message for us. Um, but we'll, I'll pray for Paul before he does, but we're going to do Purify My Heart, please, Tony.
creative abilities Lord and for all that you've put in his heart for today and thank you that it's been a long time um, in in his mind in the process and we just pray that it would all come together um, as as you intend it to Lord today so be with him um, steady his any nerves Lord and help him think clearly and speak slowly enough for this message in Jesus name sake Amen, Amen. As you know, uh, me and my speech, um, I tend to do speak quite fast, but I'm really hoping and praying that this morning I just, which one am I, slow down a bit and uh, you'll be able to hear what I'm saying. Um, so I think for this morning I need to put this up my t-shirt, so I'll just, um, oh, excuse me, I'll just do it. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, um, oh, it's quite loud actually. Should that have any problem this morning? So, purify my heart, refine and inspire, um, honed, and ready for use, all aspects of God's creative process. Um, I'm focusing on one particular one this morning, but yeah, there are times when he um, refines us in the heat, in the furnace. There are times when he needs to sharpen us, put us through that grinder. And sometimes when he needs to carve us and work away at us and do something in us to shape us in some way. Um, so, uh, I've got a couple of things to do. Need to run that one's out there. There's another one down there. Just out of the way. Something a bit different this morning. Um, uh, you know those moments where you spend months and months going over things in your head and you're trying to remember things and learn things and just when you need them there, that you think, well, <laughs> where are they? Oh, it's coming. But I'll just roll with it and see how it goes, um, see what happens this morning. So something a bit different. Um, I think we're used to the kind of format where we have a Bible reading, we have verses discussed, explained, expounded, and so on, and meanings attached and challenges to put into our lives. Um, sometimes we're spoon-fed some answers. Um, there's a bit of irony there, you'll see why later on. Uh, but this morning it's more about giving us things to think about and dwell on and focus on as we go away. It's the one thing to come here and listen and learn and be challenged, but also it's when we've gone away and we're thinking about things, when we're doing the washing up or walking the dog or having a shower or something. As we reflect on things, that's what gives God that really fertile soil to shape our thoughts, our understanding, our outlook and our perspectives on things, to bring to mind things we may be blind to, um, to help us make changes and go forward in a way that we're, um, we're growing in our faith and our characters and taking our place in this world, in God's world, um, in the church and so on. So that's what this morning is going to be about. Um, so let me this pulpit. Um, some of you may notice that I'm wearing a tatty old pair of jeans and we used to use speakers at least being half decently dressed. And I don't know if I am half decently dressed at the top. Oh, sorry, a bit loud. Um, but just to say that I'm doing something that might get a bit grubby this morning, and that's why I'm wearing these, these jeans. So, um, actually, there is a story with these jeans, and I'll, I'll tell you that. And uh, it all started, oh, 
many years ago in those dark, misty days before we had children. You, parents understand, that, won't you? What, what was life like before we had children? I, I, I remember. Um, there was one bright but cloudy afternoon at church camp, and that's coming up in a few weeks. It was a great place to come to have fun, fellowship, um, explore in the forest, you can play around the field and, and uh, play with your friends, and so many things to do. It's great, a great time, it really is great. And uh, if you have hobbies, you can bring your hobbies there as well, indulge them to your heart's content. And I've always got some kind of calligraphy project or carving project on the go. Um, and I was sat there one bright afternoon, and uh, I was using an axe at the time. I was carving away, and the call went out. Daytime, two minutes! Is that a good impersonation of Chris? <laughs> could you, would you mind? Yeah. Actually, it was, it was tea time, actually. Can you do tea time? Tea time! Two minutes. Yeah, so it was like that. So anyway, I thought, oh, tea's in two minutes. I love tea. You just have apple pie and apple crumble and custard, which I love. So I thought, just do this quick, quick, quick. And I swung the axe down. Now, I would just step out of that moment and put a bit of um, background into that. I love wood carving. Um, it's great fun. Uh, but you need to do it carefully because you can cut yourself. And I've got many cuts over the years. Um, on my projects, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears over many, many years have gone into um, what I've, I've done. That's a good song lyrics there, Tony. If you want to feel inspired to um, do a worship song with uh, on God's creative process. So, um, yeah, and cutting yourself does hurt. So I tend to be careful. I've learned over the years what kind of cuts to use, how to hold the blades, um, and, and just how much to cut, too. Uh, we're carving away. You want to cut the right amount so you're not rushing it, you're not doing foolish cuts, um, and you're bringing to shape something that you've got in your mind you want this wood to look like. And that's kind of like how God works with us. He knows what he wants to have us be at the end. He knows what he's shaping us into. We, we can't see that. We just know that we're experiencing life with all its pain and scars and, and joys and, and other things. But we experience life in all its um, kind of range of things. Um, but he's bringing us towards being so. He's shaping us in some way, cut by cut, bit by bit. There's a verse in Philippians, Philippians 1, verse 6, which says that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ. And I work in mental health and counselling for many years, and I've met many Christians who are having their struggles, and they've come for support and help. That's the verse I use with them to help them in their journey. Not, not as a way of, um, I'll read this verse and everything will be fine. No, but it's, it's a verse that gives people perspective to put things in context. And, um, oh, sorry, my mouth is really drying up. I'm used to talking this much. Mm. So put things into context for people to help them shape and formulate their perspective on what's happening to them. And that's, again, that's when God can do his work of bringing that person on in their, in their growth. <coughs> oh, where was I? Sorry? Oh, yeah, was that camp? Was that, yeah, that's where I was. Um, just 40. So... Um, yeah, also there's another verse that says, I has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That there's something wonderful, both I think in this life and in the life to come, where we just can't imagine what it's going to be like in heaven. Um, and for some people, that they go through something in this life that brings immense joy and a sense of fulfillment. John the Baptist had that experience. I'll talk more about him in a little while, if I remember. <laughs> Um, where was I going with that? Yep. Tea time! Yep. <laughs> back to the back. To, so, I'm sat with the axe. Now, normally when carving, yeah, I don't rush the cuts. And that's it. But sometimes I'm a bit thoughtless and I think, oh, just, just, yeah. So, oh, I sat there at camp with the axe and I oh, just did, did. So, I swung the axe down, came down. Now, as it's coming down, you can imagine one of those flash moments when all these thoughts go through your mind. Okay, so it's coming down and I'm thinking, oh, hang on. I'm rushing this. I don't normally rush these kinds of, especially with the, an axe, razor sharp, Grand Falls Brooks axes, are, oh, sorry YouTube, other brands are available. It was coming down, and I thought, it's stupid, why am I rushing this? Why am I doing this? It's coming down towards my legs. So it's coming down and getting nearer. Now having those thoughts probably led to what happened next, because if I'd focused on the cut, it may not have, it may have done okay, but anyway, it was coming down, and uh, hit the wood, bounced off the wood, which again surprised me, because normally the, the razor sharp would cut the wood, so it bounced off the wood, hit my knee, and that's it, I, just, I sat there, I braced myself, I waited for the brain to register the pain signal. I waited for the blood to go, pff, pff, sorry Hayley, I know you like the blood. I waited for the, the mess, I waited for the agony. 
I thought maybe I cut a nerve and I couldn't feel anything. So, uh, I think I dropped the axe, hyperlink. Cause it's, blah, blah, blah. So I waited there, braced myself, and after a, what seemed like an eternity, nothing. I felt something brush my nose. I <laughs> so I looked closely, and you'll probably see there a little hole. It wasn't as big as that when it happened. I just cut the blue fibres on top of the jeans. Underneath was a little layer of white. I just cut those top fibres, and I've never breathed the biggest sigh of relief in my whole life. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure people heard it. I probably thought it was gust of wind. That happened too while I was bracing myself. So um, anyway, went in and enjoyed tea, and uh, that's why there's a hole in these jeans. <laughs> Actually, yes, there are other holes in these jeans. Um, what happened was, several years later, I was going to work. I worked at that time at my side of house in Hyde, part of Southern Mind. Um, and I parked down, it's down near the marina, I don't know if anyone knows the area. And uh, often the car park there was a bit full, so I parked around by the marina, there of Hive. And that was occasionally full, so I parked up around the bends. I don't know if anyone knows the area, there's a little park there, well, a big park actually. And a road goes down to um, the marina there. Park there. And normally I walk back along the road to the office. It's quite scenic, I quite enjoy it. This time, I don't know why, I just thought I'd take a cut, cut through the, the park. I haven't been that way before. So there's a bank there and um, some nice looking flowers. I'll just jump up. A big area of freshly dug soil. A couple of jumps and I'll be across. So one jump and I landed knee deep in horse and cow manure. <laughs> now, I, those moments where you stand there and you think, am, am I dreaming? Is this real? What? what? So by the time I kind of realised I was, I, was, I was awake, it wasn't my waking dream, but I turned around carefully. You don't want to lose a shoe in that sort of mess. I don't want to dig for that. So carefully trudged out of this stuff. It didn't even smell. I was on a road. It didn't smell anything. There's no sign up saying, here, I've laid some brush yours and calm when you're watching your step now, you know, what me like. Nothing like that at all. So maybe locals know about it, but I sure didn't. So walked around to the office, shaking off as I went. <laughs> Got some funny looks from passers-by. Including dog walkers, we're trying to have a hard time keeping the dogs away from sniffing me. <laughs> Got to the office and knocked the door and said, I think I better go home. Once I explained why, that they, well, once I stopped laughing, they agreed, yeah, just, just go home. So made it home and uh, got them into a carrier bag, and put them out the front door. I thought, sooner or later, I'll have to clean these. So two and a half years later, <laughs> I put those in the bag and the smell had gone. That's something. They're still a bit ground and grubby, so I put them through the wash. And look, <laughs> as good as new. <laughs> Except for this, this, that, that one there. I think it's the one behind me, but I won't turn around and show because it would be a bit rude on YouTube. So um, they survived a savage axe attack. They survived being buried alive in horse and cow for two and a half years. And survived being eaten alive by rats and mice and nighttime monsters and things. So they're actually, although they're tatty, they're very special to me, as you can imagine why. I know there's a trend now in um, popular culture with uh, people having ripped jeans, and they're, they're made that way, but if I go around and say, oh, well, he's been buried in cow manure and eaten alive, uh, you know, I'm sure it'd be cooler than, well, you know, I'm too old to be cool anyway. Anyway, I need to, um, just need to move this pulpit. So, a few months ago, oh, sorry. A few months ago, the call went out, sorry? Oh, sorry, I need it. I shall put it down here for the time being. Uh, mind you both, actually. A few months ago, the call went out to help with some gardening at the back, um, do some roaming of the grass, trim some tree branches. My ears picked up at that. I thought, trim some tree branches, some free wood. I was going to wear my survivor jeans. These are my survivor jeans, by the way, that's what I call them. My survivor jeans, my, my hat, and bring a lunch and everything. But it was on a Tuesday. I worked Tuesday, so I couldn't do that. So I sat in church um, the following Sunday. Can you hear me down here while I'm doing this? Yeah. So I sat in church to... You're not just saying that, are you? You can. <laughs> no. sat in church to following a Sunday, listening with some envy, forgive me, as I listened to what they'd been doing. But then I listened in shock and horror as I heard that somebody had gone to get a blowtorch to blowtorch the branches. Why would you... you know, Jeff, where is he? Is he here? Why would you... Was it Jeff or was it you, Mark? Someone did it. Why would you want to do that? That lovely wood. You could do so many things with that. Oh. So I went down later in the week. Oh, this bit I wonder. Let's see. Oh, maybe I should just stick it like that. Oh, oh. 
the whole of my teeth. <laughs> yeah, back to me. So I um, went down the back during that week and salvaged some of that wood. It's very messy as well when you burn wood and it charges outside. It's extremely messy. Just got to go up to pick up some of this and show you what horrible damage was done to these lovely branches. So, oh, which one is it? No. Is that one? Okay. Well, first of all, I better just lay this out just to. Oh, no, it's just. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, here's what they did to the. It's lovely, but I mean, this wood, you could do so much with it. I think it's aspen or um, poplars, a lot of trees down there with that, but um, I think aspen, I make a lot of toothpicks and toothbrushes, uh, matchsticks with it. So it's good stuff, not very durable. Um, but you can see it's been well and truly charred. Now here's one. That's how I even put stuff in the bag. Not too much of a mess. Here's one I actually did clean up a little bit. I scraped off all the, well, still a bit black as you can see, all the charcoal, cleaned it up fairly well, sealed the end, and you know, took, took some care of it. I nurtured it because I had in mind to do something with it. Oh. And that's what God does to us. He takes us from that pile of stuff to be burned and, and thrown away. He scrubs us up, he cleanses us um, from our sin, from the to him of forgiveness and repentance. And he has a mind to do something in us, to start to create a process in us of building us up, of shaping us, moulding us, carving us, refining us in some way, to, to be something that only he knows. We have to go along with the process in faith and just accept that he's going to lead us on this path, on this journey of faith. But in the end, he'll bring us to where he wants us to be. So let's see if we can do something with this this morning. Also, um, just as another point, um, he's onto something of how, well, yeah, I kept it, I got it home, wrapped them up um, in uh, bin bags, kept them cool, because they were going to go through a natural kind of process of decay. And uh, so I thought, preserve them in some way to use them. And that is something of how I look back on my own life, and I feel that that's going to happen to me, almost since birth. Um, looking back on my life, the experiences I've had, the people I've known and been with, um, things I've been through, things that have happened to me, influences that I've come across, so many things that have, that could have taken me on so many different routes. And often I wonder, why am I not as messed up as I am now? <laughs> why am I not as worse than I am now? Um, I've met many Christians who, they've got horrendous, horrific past and background before they became a Christian, even afterwards. And I think, why, why have I not experienced that myself? Um, there's a verse that talks about um, those he foreknew, those, those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's a verse that there's a lot of debate about that. What does it mean in detail, in practical terms? Um, the old debate about predestination and so on. All I know is, I look back on my life and I feel I could have gone so many ways I didn't. And I'm thankful for that before I became a Christian. Um, also, in Hebrews, there's a verse that talks about it makes his angels ministers and they're sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. And again, does that mean we have angels that somehow do things for us to um, guide us on? What, what does that look like in detail? I don't know. We don't know the verses there. It means something. We we'll just trust by faith that God knows what he's doing and we'll just have to accept that and go along with it. So, what can we do with this? Let's have a look. Ah. Alright, so I better put this on my pocket actually. I wonder if 
Jesus had anything like this. This is the 42,000 mud bowl workbench, series one. Um, I've got a few ideas from upgrades, you know, there's a lot of things, they're very fluid, very basic, but it serves a purpose anyway. But Jesus would have spent the first 18 years of his life as a carpenter, as the Bible says. Well, the word used for carpenter is tecton, which in those days was um, more like a general builder. But not the kind of building that we have in these days, you know, brick and stone and big trucks and excavators and cranes. It's more about working with wood, um, working with leather, working with metals, um, making your own tools, um, working with fibres and cordage, the gnashings and things. A lot of things he would have been involved in. Um, when he was 12, he would have learned his father's trade, which he was a <laughs> carpenter, um, or, or tecton. And uh, can you imagine the awkwardness of his first day when he would have turned around and said, um, now, now listen, son, I, I know you were there at the beginning of time. You spoke and said, let there be this universe. And out of nothing, you created this whole universe in about six days. And now here you are, I've got to teach you how to work this wood and this stone and use these tools and make these tools and run a business. <coughs> okay, oh, I can't fathom that. So, can, can you imagine that? Was that the sort of conversation you would have had, do you think? Um, I wonder if Joseph was tempted to think, now, we're going to do this, son, but if anything goes wrong, just say the word and fix it, you know. <laughs> uh, the Bible says he was a just and upright, honest man. So I think he would have been more likely saying, now listen, son, now you can just say the word or think it, and you'll conjure something up out of nothing. But no, we're honest, good craftsmen, we take delight and pride in what we do, we're honest. So if somebody's doing, you work with your hands, you work with these tools, and we make it, and we shape it get it done. Even if it takes a long time. Uh, so, um, Also, besides working on materials, it was about running a business as well. So he would have been responsible for, he would have learned how to, um, well firstly, take orders. How do you take orders? Do you advertise yourself? I went to the British Library, oh, what, what year was that? 2008, 2009? You might be in there, Gerald. They had a display of, um, uh, ancient um, religious manuscripts and texts from around the world. One of them was a 4th century tourist guide to Jerusalem. Uh, I thought, what? They existed back then. Michelin guide to Jerusalem. And <laughs> maps, where to eat, where to stay, inns. Um, well, only if in Jesus' day they had the same sort of thing in Nazareth. Here's a tourist guide to Nazareth. Here's where you can find the carpenters, the, 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 the farmers. Um, here's where you can buy food. And that sort of thing is incredible what they had in those days. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there? I was going to put something in my notes because <laughs> my memory doesn't serve me well, I'm afraid. Oh, yeah. So, all the tools that Jesus would have um, learned to use, even make, um, there's a recent, more recent years, apprentices, um, their first task was to make the first hand plane and to use that, and that, that became kind of a work of art. And, indicator of a level of skill. Um, but Jesus would have been familiar with, for example, you know, axes. He would have been familiar with them. Um, you're familiar with um, planes. Oh, you're not. Someone on the plane, sorry. Catch that. <laughs> this style of plane was used by the Romans. And in fact, Hasn't changed at all, hardly, in about two, three thousand years. Um, kind of plane that Jesus would be familiar with and used, learned to use, and learned to make, to shape the wood. It's been said it's been the most important invention in woodwork ever, I think. Um, saws. Ah, oh, well, if the. Draw up in the. Oh, no. Anyway, doesn't matter. Saws. This is the sort of saw that would have been in Jesus' workshop, hanging up on the rack. Um, invented by the Egyptians. They invented it and used bronze and had roughly cut teeth in the metal. The Romans made it of iron, make it more sturdy, and they also set the teeth to poke out a bit left and right. Alternatively, 
It's about to widen the cut, so when jamming the cut, when you're sawing the wood. But the runs are quite inventive. They also had little workbenches, which were loads of ground, a bit like this. A bit like a kind of, I suppose, small door size. Very portable, easily portable, so you may well have been using that. Um, chisels, hammers, all sorts, were in Jesus' day. Um, there's every chance that he works at nearby Sepphoris, about an hour's walk away. At that time, Herod was rebuilding the palace in the city, and there's probably an opportunity to get work there. Maybe Jesus hired laborers to help him um, if he was working there. But also, it was about securing orders, it was about um, getting supplies of wood, because as you can imagine, Israel is not exactly covered in forests. He had to, to send overseas for Lebanese cedar, African thyine wood, or tamarisk trees, citron wood, and so on. They were expensive, so you had to also work out how to get an order, get some kind of payment, get the supplies, work to a time scale, all well, those kind of aspects of things that he would have been doing. Um, tradition has it that, um, actually I've got to go back in the haven't I? Where is it? Tradition has it that Jesus would have died um, a few years before, sorry, not, no, Joseph would have died. <laughs> A few years before Jesus started his ministry. Um, if that's the case, then he would have become responsible then for family finances, being the firstborn son. It was down to him to kind of leave the family, um, pay for things and so on. Ooh, now see, this wood is getting quite stressed, resisting its blade. See, when you burn wood, a lot of strange things happen to it. So, Wood always comes with its own kind of stresses and strains. You think about the trunk of the tree, it's, it's there, it's solid, but it's got a big heavy tree on top of it and it's being blown by the wind. If you've got branches that hang out, you've got the weight of the branch plus the end, again, they're being blown by the wind. It's fine wood and the end of it and so on. So they grow, but there's kind of inbuilt stresses and strains in them. So when you cut the tree and you mill it and you turn it into lumber, that wood comes with kind of hidden stresses. Um, within it. Oh. That's all us. Um, where was I? Trust and strains. And many times I've been doing a project and I've been surprised. I've done these cuts, but why is the wood not behaving as it should? <laughs> because of the stress that you release when you cut the wood. And again, God shapes us by cutting us. And he releases some of that stress from our past, from our, our experiences. Um, allowing us to become more natural in ourselves and to be a person that you can use to, to mould and shape in some way. So I might have to reconsider on doing this. I'm saying it was cut all the way through, but it's not going to quite do that. What I have to do is ring around it and then... Now if I had my Japanese saw, that would go for a lot of butter. That's the <laughs> Japanese saw is just the absolute best. If I left it at home, Anyway, I'm going to do something a bit more dramatic than just if you saw it, just to get the axe out and axe it through. Might take a bit longer than planned. <laughs> no, no, don't rush. Remember, you rush. Oh, that'd be trouble. I had a good cut on the finger the other week, actually. I, was, I almost cancelled today because it was quite a deep, nasty cut, but very decorative. I had a really clear, serrated edge of the skin. Because the knife was, it was wood carving. I was carving, well, not kind of carving, I was the ice in the freezer. I had a big kitchen carving knife, hacking away at the ice. Now, I don't do a nami pan the, the ice button on the freezer. Now, for me, it's a big knife, and And I held it in a stupid way, and then, before you know it, and scratch. Oh, sink, quick. So, in fact, I see that perfectly, actually. So I'll put a lot of pressure on it, and it's, um, yeah. You can't see the serrations anymore, anyway. So yeah, I think we'll just have to... Yeah, sometimes God works in us, but we're stubborn. We don't want to go God's way. We went, what happened to, um, who was it went to Nineveh? Jonah. Yeah, what happened to him? But eventually God got through to him. And uh, helped him through, got him through. Got him eventually to do Jonah of his own accord, actually, when you've been through something and chose and said, well, actually, no, I've been a fool. I should do what God commands me. So, oh, sorry. 
a little bit deeper here and then we'll get the exhale and just exit away. Nope, it's not going to do it. So where's the X? <laughs> right, so well. Now, do you know, I've got a charcoal office actually, but there's still more on there. And um, it's not a complete waste actually, because charcoal itself has got so many uses. You can make ink from it, um, face scrubs, skin cream, soap, all sorts of things. Um, also, you shouldn't swallow charcoal. Um, but if you swallow something else you shouldn't swallow, then you can't swallow charcoal. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like too long to do make a right, kind of. If you're watching at home, don't try that at home. Um, seek medical advice uh, if you do swallow something you shouldn't swallow. I have to access that, I think, just to... Is that more dramatic than just sawing it? More manly as well. Yeah. Um, so. I'll do it quick, so... I didn't plan for this, actually. I was hoping it would just saw through. Joseph and Jesus and on there oh, doing their work and hacking away at things and hammering away. on a plan, but you can up, don't worry. Oh, there's a bit of a knock there, it's going to be... section is quite quite sort of and helpful. How's that doing? Let's try to saw again. Oh yeah. So when you um heat the wood, it already carries a lot of tension and stress in it. And when you burn it with a blowtorch, you do a lot more things to it because wood freshly cut contains a lot of water. So you heat that water up, and that water then adds to the stress and pressure that's already in there. So once you get through those exist those outer layers, you can kind of sort of a bit more, a bit more freely. See, I'm hitting a bit more pressure there. The scale blade. It's actually, actually, this sword is probably about 100 years old, I think. Something like that, 150 years old. This is that plane down there. Right, stand up again. So let's get the old wax. Let's see what we can do. Where's the worst part? Come on, baby. Come. On. Here. <laughs> right. Ah. Part two. Oh, I can't do a part two. I need to do my own. <laughs>
<laughs> Time's getting on a bit. Um, it was when you continue and finish. It'll be about another 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you all happy with that? Yeah. You got anything in the oven? Okay. So, here we are. What can we do with this piece of wood? Any ideas? Fire? Yeah, actually, aspirin is not great for a fire because it's, it's quite resistant to heat, actually, so they make matrix out of it. So, um, I won't burn that well. I think it's aspirin anyway. Um, it's hard to tell with the email spelling it. Um, so, it could be part of the furniture, it could be a, a, an armrest, it could be a headrest, it could be, could be a, a chair leg, um, also, it could be a, oh, look, there's a there's a ladle in there, or a spatula even. Can we something to cook with? Well, that one's not that durable for making cooking ware because it's, um, yeah, it can break down after a lot of use. Anyway, I'm not interested in this bit. I'm interested in the skate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in this bit, the offcut. Does anyone ever feel like they're an offcut in this world, or even in the church? You know, in the world where you feel a bit shunned, you don't feel important, not taken seriously, um, people don't have time for you, um, you feel just not really worth much. That's the kind of person that Jesus takes and uses. In the Bible it talks about how he met with um, prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners, the, the kind of scum of society he spent time with. And people responded to him because he loved them. And they weren't you know, hiding anything, they, they were aware of their sin, they responded to his love. Um, powerful ways at times. Um, and yeah, so this off cut is kind of, I feel like this off cut myself through my life. I've been the runt of jokes, I've been the one who's always been put down and picked on and so on. But God has taken me and is crafting me into something. I don't know what yet, but I know that I'm in process. Um, so let's see what we can do with this piece of wood. Uh, do you know, has anyone ever been? Cooking away, you've been um, uh, cooking some uh, uh, bacon or steak or eggs on a frying pan with a spatula, and you're there cooking away. Do you ever have a moment where you just wish the spatula had a built in spoon? <laughs> no, I have. And, and I've, well, actually, I haven't. Um, but one day I'm going to invent the spoon chiller. Um, the day is coming when one day you're cooking away and you just wish your spatula had a spoon on the end, so you could use it, or in the middle, so you could use it. So in the future, look out for the screen chiller at Robert Dyes and John Lewis. Ask, sorry, other stores are available. Um, ask for the, the, the thorny spoon chiller. And uh, I haven't invented it yet. Maybe somebody else might beat me to it. If that's so, then fair enough, me and my big mouth. Um, so let's see what we can do with this spoon. Actually, I'm going to... Oh, well, that's better. I can't wait, don't you? So, uh, actually, if I stand up, it's easier. I can see what I'm doing. Again, my memory is uh, not playing ball. Oh, yeah. Right, let's just do something and see what we get. The time's getting on. Do you know? Can you hear, can you hear me about all this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know? In Jesus' time, it's quite loud, actually. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what. If we do a part two, shall we? And I'll do a bit to this and come back. Well, not using an axe. I'll be um, using something else. Make it a bit quieter. Will that, will that be all right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, is what we are. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll do that. So, they can't it being so noisy. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, what I'll do is, yeah. So these kind of crafts that Jesus did in his day, they're still around. Um, there are actually some professional craftsmen who use nothing but hand tools in their work, and they create some great stuff. All the way from tiny decorative 
ornaments to huge bits of furniture just with their bare hands. It's incredible what they do. That's the kind of creativity God has put into us in their hearts. Um, and there's a lot of talk about them dying out, and some of them are dying out. In the UK, there's only one professional clogmaker left who makes clogs professionally. Um, he's up north somewhere. There's one person who does four-edge print, four-edge painting. Remember when you children you saw books where the edge was painted with a picture? When you open the book, you couldn't see it when the book was closed. When you open the book, the pages moved a bit and you saw the picture appear like magic. There's one person left who's doing that professionally. So some of these crafts are kind of dying out. But in Scandinavia, um, I think at age 12, there's a thing called sloid, which basically means make it yourself if you want it. I think at age 12, they make their own knife and that's theirs for life. And that's what I had to use. I had to carve wood, make things out of wood, a bit of metal work, textiles and so on. Um, and that's quite popular in Scandinavian countries, which I think is incredible because they invented IKEA. Um, you know, cheap, my last five minutes, chipboard furniture mass produced in China. Oh, sorry, um, other stores are available as are countries where it's made. I'm going to start World III if I'm not careful. Um, and uh, where was I? Scandinavia. Yeah, so yeah, these arts, these kind of crafts are still around. Um, Jesus, Jesus, it says in the Bible, a little beauty of our Lord be upon us and direct, establish the work of our hands for us. And our hands reach out into another person's life and they shape them um, in some way with the tools that we have. I mean, I have some great tools here, some of which I made myself. But we have tools that God has given us, you know, the tools of love, patience, understanding, listening, kindness, acceptance, um, just companionship, just being with somebody, um, empathy, all those kind of things. That's the work of our hands that we need to be put into practice to shape another human life as we're designed to do, because God shapes us with his love. So if I um, end it there, I'll uh, bring this little thing back a little bit more shapely and uh, avoid having to use the old wax. In fact, it was this baby. Where is it? This is the one that did the deal on my jeans. This little baby. That's my baby. Yeah. Okay. He's going to... Okay, then. We're going to have a, one song to finish, and then afterwards there is going to be a CD track. Um, I was just going to say, if anybody wanted to pray after the service, if I'm happy to pray with you. If you felt like you wanted some prayer, I'm more than happy to pray with you. Um, so we're going to sing The Potter's Hand, and the, the track, if anyone's interested afterwards, is called Build This House, and it's by Lou Fellingham. Um, Unless, I unless you build this house, I'm laboring in vain, is the message of that. So thanks, Tony and Maureen. Beautiful Lord, wonderful
right not to finish in prayer, so I'll just um, end by prayer. Okay. Oh, no, maybe I won't. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for um, this morning together, the, for your service with us, Lord. This is a service, but um, you call us to serve you, Lord, and we do pray that we, you would take us and you would mould us. Um, may we remember we are clay and that you are the potter, and may you mould us into the person you want us to be. For Jesus' name's sake, amen.